Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar. We're gonna give about two more minutes and then we'll get started at exactly a minute after 12. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll get started in just a moment. Well, thank you so much for joining us for our third and final webinar in our Lunch and Learn series. I'm Tina Norris and I'm the Family Engagement Specialist here at PTC. A couple of um, things that I wanna share with you really quickly. Um, if you have questions, um, this is a hour long presentation and uh, Dr. Zippor gives a huge amount of information. So if you have <laughs> questions, um, please feel free to utilize the chat feature. And she has agreed to answer questions throughout the presentation. Um, also at the conclusion of today's webinar, there is a survey and I would ask for you to take just a few moments and complete the survey for us as well. Your feedback is very valuable and we of course want to hear from you. So at this time, I will uh, turn it over to Dr. Sapora, and she will be conducting today's webinar on teaching, keeping students engaged. Sapora. Thank you, Tina, and thank you everyone for taking the time to uh, join me today. Uh, as Tina mentioned, I am Dr. Sapora Levy Shackleford of Creative Approach Development Center. Um, this is the third uh, part of a virtual learning series that I've been working with PTC on for the month of October, and I'm very appreciative of all of you taking the time to join us today. So for today's discussion, um, we will be talking about a variety of things. We have an hour. Um, so we're going to talk about why virtual learning is challenging for some learners, the importance of communication during this time when we're um, participating in virtual learning, how to create a supportive virtual learning environment, and how to create a virtual learning behavior plan, as well as some tips for diverse learners. All right. So a little bit about Creative Approach Development Center. Um, I am located in Richmond, Virginia, and I provide a wide variety of services. I provide the one-on-one -on -one behavioral life coaching, as well as group workshops, uh, lots of different webinars like this and online courses. And then we conduct the inclusivity teamwork and um, consulting um, workshops for different organizations. We focus on mental health, intellectual and developmental disabilities, dual diagnoses, and leadership development. So we're going to get into a topic that is very popular um, this time of year with everything that's going on, and that is virtual learning. And we'll start out by looking into the why virtual learning is a challenge for some of our students. And some of the main reasons is because it's different. Um, it's something that none of us really have um, experienced before. So this is causing a lot of changes in routines and structure. There is a difference because they're at home with the teacher speaking to them, you know, remotely. So there's not that hands-on um, support that they're used to receiving. Um, the teachers have less of that redirection power like they would have if they were physically there in the classroom with them. 
um, there's less opportunities for the students to model the behaviors of their peers, which helps a great deal with learning and comprehension. And then we all know that behavior at home is different a lot of times than where it is out at school and um, out in the community, because at home we're more comfortable and there's a lot more distractions. So that's another reason why virtual learning can be a challenge for some students. So I recommend when I'm talking with families, several steps, about seven different steps to help out with this virtual learning environment. And the first thing that I recommend is to create a virtual learning plan. And even though it's October, a lot of parents feel like, well, the year has started and it's too late. It's not too late. This is something that you can do right now still. So what a virtual learning plan is, is a actual plan or like a blueprint that allows you and your learner to think about their um, daily um, schedule and, and classes and then decide several things. First, on this virtual learning plan, you figure out what materials are needed for learning. Now you can do one plan for the day, or if your learner needs more details, you may want to do a plan for each course. Um, so what materials do they need um, to complete the activities for that class or for the day? Then you wanna think about how do they handle um, feelings of frustration or anxiety and those feelings when they're overwhelmed? Talk about that when they are calm so that they have the opportunity to think about how that feels to them, what they experience, as well as what they need to um, overcome those, those different feelings and be able to get back on track and focus. You wanna talk to them about um, figuring out when they need a break. So helping them figure out when, what signs to look for that tell them that they need a break and then how to manage their break. So it's not just um, a focused time of learning and then break time is just unstructured because that makes it really hard to transition back to the learning period. And then how to handle those times where they start feeling confused and start falling behind. So those are some things you wanna include in your virtual plan. Um, before I show you an example of a plan, and I also sent the template to Tina, so that will be coming with you with the um, copy of these slides. So you will have a, a virtual plan template that you're welcome to use with your learner. So some key features for this virtual learning plan is to make sure that your learner participates with, you know, participates with filling it out. It's not something you want to do for them, but you want to have an open dialogue with them so that you can get their input and help walk them through um, the process of checking in with their body to figure out, oh, you know what, when I start feeling anxious, I notice that my breathing changes or I start fidgeting my hands more. So you're helping them start to um, learn how to assess themselves and figure out how they're feeling um, which will help them figure out what tools and resources they need um, to get back to that baseline. You wanna make sure that once you've made this learning plan, that you have it printed out and it's posted somewhere that's easy to see and access. So a lot of times we make these different things and we kind of tuck them away. This is something that you wanna have readily available for your learner. So during the course of the school day, if they need any of these different um, steps or um, to look at the different procedure that you guys have developed, they can do that easily. You wanna make sure that you share this information, this learning plan with the teachers and the rest of the support team, because sometimes uh, your learner may realize that they need something like a water break um, every 20 minutes or um, a fidget, or they may need to have some paper and a pencil nearby so that they can doodle to help them concentrate. And you want your teachers to know what's going on so that they don't feel that your learner is just not paying attention um, and off task. And then update it as needed. It's not set in stone. So you want to go ahead and design this virtual learning plan and then check in with your learner to see if it's still effective. And if not, you can uh, modify it accordingly. And I also recommend taking the time now to start thinking about a transition plan 
and start working on that for in-person learning, which eventually we will get back to. And this way it allows you to um, come up with a structured plan. And then uh, when discussions start heading towards your school opening back up, you can start implementing it in phases rather than um, rushing your, your learner into transitioning back to in-person learning quickly. So I'm going to show you this is the virtual learning plan that I have designed. Um, and again, I sent a copy to Tina, so this will be coming to you in the email with the slides. And uh, the first part up here, you fill in your learner's name because this is their learning plan. And then here in this box here is where you would put the different items that they need to make sure that they have in their workspace every morning. So they can look at this here and gather their uh, items independently. I love music. Um, I use music all day long personally to help set me in different moods, depending on what task I'm about to get into. I have music for cleaning, music for relaxing, music for starting my day. And I highly recommend adding music into your learner's day uh, for the same reasons. So, so um, Deborah, I'm sorry, we're not able to see the, um, the screen. It's still showing um, your key virtuals. Okay, let's see. Let me, I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. Okay, can you guys see it now? Yes. The learning plan? Yes. All right, sorry about that. Thank you for letting me know. All right, so what I was saying is uh, the name goes up here, the virtual learning plan for your learner. And then in this first box is where you guys can list the different materials that you need for school each day. This second box here is where you can jot down, you know, your learner can jot down some of their favorite songs that kind of gets them pumped up and ready to start today. Then you want to start having that discussion about what it feels like to need a break. So do you notice that you're drifting off more? You're not able to pay attention. Maybe your legs get a little bit, you know, you start bouncing your legs some or you start fidgeting. What are those different um, things that your learner does that lets them know that they need a break? Then there's going to be times where they start feeling overwhelmed and confused and maybe even upset. So these next boxes here are where you can have that discussion with your learner and break down um, what that feels like. So it helps your learner be able to identify again, oh, I noticed that um, I'm starting to get more fidgety or I noticed that my stomach is starting to feel hotter because I'm getting frustrated and I'm getting angry or I notice that I'm starting to feel like I'm panicking because I don't understand what I'm supposed to do. So that information will be jotted down in these areas. Um, so your learner, again, the sheet will be posted in, in their workspace and they're able to um, look at it and identify where they are in the process. Then here, like I said, we wanna make sure that they have structured breaks. So this is where you can provide your learner some ideas of things they can do during the breaks to help them. Um, really, you know, relax for a second, but still stay in that mindset of learning so they can get right back to work. This next positive vibes are just some positive um, affirmations to use when you start feeling frustrated. And then the important email addresses. Um, I'm not sure which systems everybody's using, but I know popular ones are Schoology and PowerSchool. And sometimes it's hard to find teachers' email addresses um, in that list. So, here you can just jot down the different teachers email addresses um, and that way if your learner needs to send an email or send an assignment or something it's all on this sheet and it's easy to find so again this will be emailed to you and feel free to use it you can print out as many copies as you need and i hope it's helpful so now i am going to go back tina can you guys see the slides again not yet. Okay, I might have to stop and start again. How about now? Yes. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. So now we are back. All right. So the next step that I highly recommend to make virtual learning successful is developing a strong communication plan. 
And there's two sides to this. So for you as the uh, learner's main support, you're working with the teachers and their support, other support staff or support team members, and you're working with the learner themselves. So with the teacher, you want to, like I mentioned earlier, make sure that you share the virtual learning plan and talk about um, different key things to look for as signs of being frustrated or overwhelmed or needing help. Because sometimes your learner may be too shy or maybe even embarrassed to say when they need help. So this will allow your teacher to kind of look for some key signs where they can uh, maybe reach out to your learner and ask them if they need to take a break or if they need some additional assistance with something. You want to look at and reestablish goals and objectives. I know last year um, during IEP meetings, there were specific goals and objectives created, but taking the time to look at those and reassess to make sure that they're appropriate for the additional um, challenges and changes that are taking place today. So looking at that and then having conversations um, with the teacher and the other um, team members to make sure that goals and objectives are um, appropriate for the current situation. You wanna talk with the teacher to identify office hours and use this time to set up some reoccurring meetings so that you can stay in touch with the teachers to discuss progress and any challenges that you may notice. Um, so you can kind of stay ahead of the game and then you can also get that feedback from the teacher so that you can hear what the teacher is seeing, um, you know, as far as progress and challenges and you guys can all work together to address everything. You wanna uh, have a discussion about how you're gonna measure that progress. And this is important when you're working with the other um, support services. So if your child is still receiving um, OT or PT, you know, if they are um, working towards a specific goal, you want to have that open communication with them to find out how do they want you to collect the data? Do they have a form that they want you to fill out? Um, would they rather you send a periodic email? Or, you know, would it be helpful if you showed them videos? And this is great if your child is receiving like occupational therapy services, you can maybe show a video of their workstation and maybe um, a challenge that they're experiencing related to um, the computer or using the mouse and um, the OT will be able to see it and then provide some uh, strategies for you to use. And then you want to continue to have that communication plan just to have everybody on board and involved. And as the year progresses, um, if a different challenge pops up, then um, everybody is, is still involved in the um, plan enough to be able to jump in and say, well, I think that's something that speech can handle or maybe the uh, resource teacher can handle. So another benefit of having that communication plan. Um, with the communication, you want to make sure you're talking with your learner often because, you know, we're all feeling very overwhelmed with all of these different changes and limitations that we've been experiencing because of the pandemic. So I have a wide variety of check-in rubrics is how, what I like to call it because we want to make sure that we're taking the time to not only support our learners with the different changes with learning, but we also want to support them emotionally. So these are just some examples of some check-in rubrics that um, I have um, passed on to different teachers as well as families just so that your learner can quickly let you know where they um, fall emotionally. So uh, the top one is just some emojis, you know, if you are teaching, you can have your um, learners just type in which emoji they're feeling. And then um, the, the flower one too, with the different, um, different phrases. Um, sometimes it's hard to admit when you're having a hard time and it's easier to just say, I'm, I'm prickly as a cactus today. Um, sometimes that comes out easier than saying I'm having a hard time. So just some, some suggestions on ways to check in with your learner um, to see how they're doing emotionally. Um, so again, you wanna talk with your learner often about how they feel about the different changes and you wanna take the time to acknowledge and validate their feelings. You want to help them work through different feelings of sadness and anxiety, which is pretty common. But if you notice that your learner has continued to have these um, feelings of sadness and anxiety for several weeks and you're noticing it in um, 
across environments. So it's not just related to school. They're starting to show less interest in different things that they usually show a lot of interest in. And you're just noticing a, a change in them. Then I suggest that, um, you know, making an appointment for them to, to talk with their pediatrician um, that can guide you um, to another professional that may be able to help just to make sure that, um, you know, your learner is not experiencing um, extreme anxiety or even depression. And then you wanna talk with them and help them learn how to develop um, self-care and coping routines. So that should be part of your home communication plan. So then the next stage after you've developed your communication plan and your virtual learning plan is to customize your learning. Um, and this is where you decide what works best for your learner. So, you know, with virtual learning, the majority of things are digital, but sometimes that just does not work for your learner. Is it more helpful for them to have things in print form? And if that's the case, then again, have that communication with the teachers to figure out how you can um, get access to the different um, materials in a print formation, and then for assignments that are completed in print formation, how to get them back to the teacher for grading. Um, again, with the virtual learning, it, we're doing a lot of typing, and for some of our learners, that does not work. So is there a way that you can maybe do an audio response or even a video response? Um, they off, most of the classes have breaks already built into them, does that break time work for your learner? Is it frequent enough for your learner? If not, again, that communication with the teacher, you know, my learner needs a break about every half hour. Currently, you guys have them set at 40 minutes. What can we do to, to work this out? And then you wanna make sure you have a work area with all of the specific tools and resources. So, get a quick sip of water. Step four is creating your learning environment. And um, I'm gonna break this down into different parts of that learning environment. So real quick, let me pause. Tina, do we have any questions right now or anything that needs to be repeated? No, not right now. Okay, all mm -hmm. right. So we'll get into the learning environment. So one thing, um, a lot of times, a lot of our learners have a hard time staying focused and one of the signs of that is that they get very wiggly and jittery. And um, for that, I recommend the yoga ball chair. And I have some different examples. Um, the traditional yoga ball chair with the um, seat that goes in it, like the first one you see over here. This one you can get on Amazon for about $70. Or a more cost-effective way is to get a yoga ball. They sell them in five below for $5. Um, and then a pool noodle, and you can make your own version. Then they have the disc wobble cushion, which is kind of the same concept, but it's, it's a little bit more compact, so it doesn't take up as, more, as much space. And then if you just use your regular like kitchen chair and use one of the exercise resistance bands, again, they're in five below, also in Walmart for about $5, and you could just tie it to the legs of the seat. Now what these do, is with the yoga ball and the wobble cushion, they require you to engage more of your core muscles in order to not fall. And what that does is it burns up some of the excess energy that um, usually comes out as fidgeting and wiggling. So it kind of combats that challenge. And then the chair with the resistance band does the same. Um, as your learner is sitting, they can take their legs and push back against the band. They can tuck their legs behind the band and push outward. But again, it's, it's burning up some of that excess energy um, so that it doesn't um, come out as a distraction. It's burnt off and then it allows your learner to be able to focus more um, on what they're supposed to be learning at the time. So another part with customizing your learning environment is setting up your workspace. You wanna make sure that it's a clear workspace. Um, so um, depending on the, um, the amount of room that you have, it can be a desk dedicated to your learner. A lot of learners work right at the kitchen table. I also recommend those foldable TV tables because you, your learner can use them during the day and then you can easily fold them up and put them behind the couch or in the closet so they're out of the way um, 
you know, other than when, when your learner's not in school. Um, and then trying to decrease the distractions in the area. If you are using the, the table I like or a desk, I like you to um, think of a triangle. So I have the little graphic here. You want to have your learner, this is your learner here sitting at the table. You want to have the computer in front of your learner and we'll get more into computer setup. Then I recommend having the notebook and pen so that you can take, your learner can take notes um, on the side that works, you know, they write, so I'm right-handed, I have it on the right side of the learner. And then your visual schedule, your to-do list, timer, and those other resources, right and hands reach on the opposite side of their dominant hand so that they can grab it um, when they need it. So this is the setup that I highly recommend because it puts everything in reach, um, but not all cluttered where they have to kind of dig and fight to find what they need at the moment. So getting into the computer, um, I know one of the biggest challenges with virtual learning is the um, computer challenges. And I know there's a lot of tech centers um, that can help with that, but these are some other tips to um, incorporate into your routine to try to decrease some of those computer challenges. So number one, charging the computer overnight. You also want to try to have the work area close to an outlet so um, they can plug in when the battery starts getting low. Schedule computer updates to occur overnight so that you don't have to worry about as soon as you turn on the computer, it goes into an update that takes 20 minutes and then they're late for school. Um, keep the laptops on a hard surface. So your desk, tables, counters, the little folding tables. Laptop is a very, um, it's not the greatest name for the computers. We, we call them laptops, but they're really not made to sit on your lap because they have the vents on the bottom. So when they sit on soft objects like beds, pillows, sofas, laps, they tend to overheat because the vents are blocked. So keep the laptops on those harder surfaces um, so that the airflow can um, be free and prevent the laptop from overheating. Because if it overheats, then it starts slowing down and then it will even shut itself down to prevent damage. Um, adjust the screen lighting to make it softer on your learner's eyes. You know, the virtual learning day is a long day. It's a long time to be sitting in front of the computer. So adjusting the light, making it a little bit dimmer to make the glare um, less on the eyes and, and prevent um, eye strain. Um, internet connection is another challenge. And number one, if you've had your router for more than two years, you can call up your service provider and talk to them about trading in your router for a newer version because um, the routers really last for about two years. And then, you know, at, technology is always growing so the bandwidth increases and then the routers become outdated in about two years so if you've had it for about two years just ask them about switching it um, switching out for a new one it shouldn't make any difference with your bill or anything because it's the same equipment just a newer model that can handle the faster and larger bandwidth also having your learner sit close to the router can also help increase the speed and bandwidth and everything connects to our internet now. So whatever you can disconnect from the internet during school hours should also open up bandwidth to um, help your learners stay engaged with their coursework. Um, and then play around with the accessibility features if you can. Some of the laptops only allow the IT department to do that depending on your school district. But um, if so, get in touch with IT and, um, or your help desk and see if they can do things like turn on the narration feature, adjust the font to make it larger, which can help decrease eye strain. Um, and uh, you can even change the color of the mouse to make it easier to see. So talk with your IT department if you, do, if you um, can't on your own look at the accessibility features. Um, because we're using the cameras, you want to elevate the laptop so that the camera is eye level. Um, if your learner is a little bit shorter or a little bit taller to do when you're adjusting that, remember to use the solid objects like a book um, rather than a pillow or any other soft object to raise, you know, raise up the um, height of the computer. You want to think about 
audio. So earbuds versus headphones, that makes a big difference for um, each of us. Some of us enjoy the headphones more. Um, some of us don't, can't tolerate headphones and would prefer the earbuds. So which one would be best for your learner? And then about once a week, take a, a wipe. Baby wipes work really well in a damp or damp cloth and just wipe down the keyboard and screen um, to keep the um, surface clean. You know, um, we, your learner's using it a lot during the week. So this helps decrease any kind of um, germs. It helps keep stuff from going down underneath the keys and making the keys hard to use and so forth. So um, just a little periodic wiping down as part of that computer care. So the next part of customizing your learning environment is the time management and organization. And um, I recommend the different to-do lists and visual schedules. I have two examples here. Um, we have the traditional visual schedule where it's like the picture and then the name of the activity over it. Or you can have the, um, the one that's more like an agenda, um, like the high school student schedule down here. Uh, you can color code the subjects and activities, um, include the teacher's contact information, include any resource links that may be needed. So um, links to YouTube videos that help explain like how to um, complete writing a paper or um, links to wordhippo.com, which is a really good thesaurus website. You want to keep those little links on a sheet that's kind of like a cheat sheet for your learner. Um, you want to include start and stop times for the different classes and activities. And then you even want to include the breaks um, in your schedule. And for the break, depending on your learner, uh, you may even need to break down the activities of what they need to do. So, you know, run to the bathroom, get a drink of water, stretch, and then, you know, log back into the class. So depending on how in depth your learner needs you to break things down, uh, work so accordingly with their um, schedules. I love timers and pairing timers with the visual schedules because, you know, it's great to have it in a print format and in a visual format, but the timer actually allows your learner to see that time is moving because it's a very abstract concept. Um, so they can see that time is moving and that they're running out. So you can do the traditional sand timer. That's a great way to visualize it. The kitchen egg timer. I love the traffic light timer because you set how much time it is, how much time um, a break or a certain work period is. It lights up green. When there's about one to two minutes left, it'll turn yellow to signify that you need to get ready to transition to the next activity. And then in the last 30 seconds, it'll turn red. So I love that one. And then, of course, we're in a day and age where everyone has a cell phone. So if you are using those cell phone alarms, remember to name them. Um, so at 11.45, when that alarm goes off and it says log into math class. So it's not only the, um, the sound, but then it also lets your learner know what they need to do. Manipulatives, you know, when we're in school, um, there's a lot of different manipulatives to help the learner master different concepts. Um, and I know we all look at different videos and stuff and we see those really fancy expensive ones, but just here to remind you that you can use objects right around the house as a manipulative to help your learner master different skills. So for math, um, you can use beads, you can use Cheerios, pasta, buttons, cotton balls, Q-tips, even coins. <coughs> for writing, um, I love wiki sticks, and for those who don't know, I included this little picture here of what the pack of wiki sticks looks like. They are like a little wax, like wax lines that you can bend and um, make into different shapes. But I like using the wiki sticks on pieces of paper when you have a learner that's trying to learn how to write and stay on the line. Put the wiki sticks on the different lines of your paper so it, it, um, it's raised up and it lets them know when to stop. So they're not writing slanted or some letters are too big and too small. So it's a good way to guide them um, on staying in the lines. Also taking a highlighter and highlighting the bottom line, you know, yellow and maybe the top line pink or whatever colors, again, to visually signify this is the area that your letters need to fall into. Um, for reading, 
uh, reading on the computer, this can work as well as in print. Um, but research shows that for some of us, having a different background, different color backgrounds make words pop better. And it depends on each person which color works. Um, now the picture on the far right is the, um, the actual um, reading guide papers that you can buy in packs off of Amazon for like $15 maybe depending on the bigger pack. Or you can go and just get the cellophane, which is that picture um, to the left of the, the far right picture. Um, and the reason why I like the cellophane is because it comes on a roll. So grab a couple of different, you know, colors of that and lay it over a book or even a computer screen and have your reader let you know which one helps them see the print better. That's another tip for helping with reading um, because it provides more of a contrast between the page or the screen and the actual letter. So try one of those tips out um, for reading as well as the counters and writing. Organization is very important with customizing your learning environment. So um, in my, my last video, the last webinar, the homework ones, you can always go back and look into that because I go into more detail. But um, the Shower Caddy is a great portable way to um, store all of your learning materials. The over the door organizers is, is one of my favorites and I use that one in a lot of different ways in my home. And then your traditional plastic storage bins or shoe boxes. Um, just as a way to have everything your learner needs, mainly for like elementary and middle school where they're doing more cutting and gluing and stuff. Um, just having everything together in one space, they can decorate it, they can write their name on it, they pull it out when they need it, and then when they don't need it, it, it can be put away, stored somewhere where um, it's not in the way. So once you've got your learning environment straight, you want to create your system and your routine. And I suggest getting up at the same time each day, if you can, if your learner can get up the same time they would get up um, for in-person learning, that would be the best way to do this because then when you transition back to in-person learning, it's not too big of a transition with having to get up even earlier and you know all of that. So if, if you can stay on that same schedule that you would for in-person learning, that's, that's prime. Um, but if not, at least a half hour, 45 minutes before class to give them time to get through a morning routine and be somewhat awake um, and ready for learning. I recommend getting dressed. Um, I know, you know, we're at home and we're comfortable and we kind of want to throw on a t-shirt and pajama pants. And while that's great and it helps you get comfortable, again, I feel like getting actually dressed for the day helps put your learner in that mindset that I'm in school versus, you know, lounge time at home. Um, again, you want to add music to set the mood. A morning playlist is a great way to get your learner up and going trying to set up and plan as much as you can the night before. So looking at what classes they may have the next day, talking about what, what activities they're gonna do during their breaks, even figuring out what's for snack and for lunch. So figuring out as much as you can the night before so that the next day you have a plan and it's well organized and easy to um, activate. Uh, you wanna have that system in place for what happens when you're not available to help right? Because as parents, we're multitasking too. While our learners are there in school, we're still working. We're still, you know, trying to do um, different household chores and activities. So we're not always there to sit by their side and help them. So have that discussion and, and help them figure out how they will work through different challenges when there, it is a time when you are not available. And then write this plan out and have it nearby. So, um, if they need help and you're tied up in the call, they can walk themselves through the steps of what to do until you're available or until their teacher can help. And then enlist help. Um, you know, as parents and especially special needs parents, we try to take on everything and you get burnt out. So, you know, talking with your significant other about um, helping and, and being specific about what you need for them to do to help, you know, split up this, this, um, responsibility. Talking with your older children and seeing if they can help out in some areas um, with young, younger learners. 
talking with neighborhood parents. Um, you know, we live in neighborhoods and other parents may have children in that same age group. So maybe you guys can divide and conquer and take specific days or subjects where each can help out. And then, um, you know, thinking about people in your places of worship, maybe people from work, even on your social media, um, just reaching out and seeing who may be able to help out in some of those areas that your learner is having a hard time in. And also there's a tutoring webinar that was done that provides some more information about that. So another area that I get a lot of calls about is the behavior and creating a behavior plan because virtual learning is different and we're at home and the teacher really can't do but so much to stop us from being off task. And again, you know, as a parent, you're multitasking. So how do we make sure that our learners stay on task um, during virtual learning? So what I suggest is talking about those desired behaviors and goals and being very specific and descriptive. So um, a desired goal is to keep your camera on during the class. Uh, maybe you want them to um, be act, an active participant in class. So maybe answering one question in the chat during class or put it, posting a comment during um, the class. Um, taking breaks and then getting right back to work. So you wanna be descriptive about the types of behaviors that you want your learner to engage in during the school hours. You also wanna take time to talk about those undesired um, and unwanted behaviors too. So, you know, it, you need to keep your camera on during the class and be sitting in front of the camera paying attention versus having your camera off and laying on your bed and just listening. Um, so talking about the good and desired behaviors and the undesired behaviors and writing them down because if we don't write it down, it never happened, right? So writing them down. Um, and then I like to put point values next to the different behaviors. Um, so keeping your camera on for the whole day may be worth two points. Uh, answering a question in the chat may be worth three points because your, your learners may be a little bit more hesitant to do something like that. So putting a point value next to the different desired behaviors. So now we're explaining what the desired behaviors are and now we're also making it a little bit competitive because we're adding points to it. So we're, we're trying to invest a little bit more of that buy-in with them. Um, putting those desired behaviors into a checklist or even making it into a bingo board um, and then you want to discuss some of the motivators or the like the reinforcers. So if you get 15 points for the week, you can get 20 minutes longer to play the game. Or um, if you get 30 points, we'll go to the pumpkin patch this weekend. So it's, it's tying in some of those reinforcers to motivate them to stick to um, learning this new behavior. Um, because change is hard and you know this is just a, a little bit more of a push and an incentive for them to engage in the desired behaviors. Um, so as they complete a desired behavior they um, they cross it off and then you know you guys can total the points. I recommend totaling up the points every day and celebrating these accomplishments right because these are accomplishments for the day um, and either letting them have one of their reinforcers at the end of the day or at the very least the end of the week. Um, we don't wanna push it out too long, like to the end of the month or so, unless you feel like your learner can tolerate that because um, it just gets hard and, and they kind of start feeling like, well, what's the point? I'm never gonna get to the 31st, today is just the second, right? So these are just some tips to help with the behavior. So I talked about breaks and I just really want to, um, again, mention that each learner is going to be different. So looking at your learner and seeing how long they can stay focused on a task, especially a task that's somewhat challenging, and then adjust the breaks accordingly. So, um, you know, it may be every 30 minutes, it may be 40 minutes. Your learner may even uh, only be able to tolerate focused instruction for 10 minutes. And again, that's why it's important to have that communication plan with the teacher because your teacher can help work with you to figure out ways that they can get their breaks where um, they're able to pause for a minute, but it's not disruptive to other learners. Um, 
and then talking about some of the activities to do during the break. So movement is, is definitely something that we want to get in um, during break time. So doing 15 jumping jacks or walking around the house twice or doing some stretches, maybe just taking a second to close your eyes and take some deep breaths and, and just clear your mind, going to the bathroom and getting water. You want to make sure during the break time, it doesn't become a TV time or let me get a quick, um, you know, a quick uh, game of Among Us or, you know, Fortnite in there. So you want to avoid TV and games. You want to avoid social media. You want to avoid laying down because that takes you too far off the learning path and it makes it very hard to get back on. Um, and you want to make sure that you're providing different suggestions. And then again, when you're doing that um, pre-planning the night before for the day, thinking about what they may need for any um, break so that they have that readily available. Okay, now we're gonna talk about some strategies for different types of learners. So for learners with low motor abilities, I highly recommend the slant board. This will help with writing and reading and it's something you can talk with the occupational therapist about if that is a person on your team. Um, the first picture is a traditional slant board. If you don't have access to that, you can get one of the three inch ring binders and turn it sideways and then put the papers on there. It also creates that same slant. That's helpful for lear learners with the lower mo uh, motor um, skills. Um, again, thinking about the different seating arrangements, think about different writing tools. So maybe they need a larger size pencils. Maybe you need to put the wiki, st wiki sticks on the paper. There's different weighted pens, there's um, spring-loaded scissors, there's all kinds of grips. So having that communication with your um, OT or PT and seeing what additional tools may be needed in that area. Trying a weighted lap blanket, that helps. Um, and then maybe before school and during breaks, including some stretches and different weight-bearing exercises um, to help waken the muscles um, and, and, you know, um, get them prepared for a day of learning. So for Paul, learners with, le uh-huh. We have a question. Uh-huh. And this is a great uh, segue in. The question is, um, our son really has difficulty allowing school to bleed over into home. He has separated home and school in his head and is pushing back very hard about doing schoolwork at home especially homework. Mm -hmm. He's doing in-person school, so homework is a major issue. Any suggestions? So he's in in-person school and he's still struggling with homework at, at home, I yes. think is what you're saying. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So um, I think maybe setting up a specific homework area and talking to him about this is the only spot of the home that school can invade. So having that like specific area that he helps design um, and that's the only area that school can touch in the home um, and seeing if that is helpful to him. Um, yeah, I think that that might be my, my biggest suggestion is trying to work with him to find one specific area that he will allow homework tasks to um, occur in um and and also setting up a specific time frame too um so when he comes home letting him have that time to transition and be home but then this specific time of the evening whether i don't know what time he gets home but if he gets home at three o'clock then 4 30 until 6 30 um each night is homework time it's just that homework bubble um in that specific homework area um so it's kind of compartment compartmentalizing it, my tongue tied today, um, and hopefully that will help him still be able to keep it separate. It's it's in the home, but it's in this specific area and specific time frame. So try that, and and um, I have my email at the end. Email me and let me know if that's helpful or if you need more information. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. All right. So for learners with limited communication. Um, you know, being in a virtual setting is, is a challenge for them, but I have the pictures of the index cards here. And what I like, you can take the index cards and a popsicle stick, um, 
think of uh, yes and no and you know having it on the popsicle stick so if the teacher asks a question they can simply hold up the yes or no um, same thing with the ABC where the teacher can ask multiple choice questions and they can answer that way um, that's been very helpful making sure that the keyboard is accessible for typing replies so again if you think about that triangle that um, keyboard should be right in front of the learner towards the end towards the bottom of the triangle where the learner is if you have a separate keyboard if it's the laptop then of course it's attached but it still will be right in front of them um, and think about whether or not they may need like the slant board um, or that binder to help them with typing so maybe the keyboard will need to be at a slant make sure there's access to communication devices if your learner uses a communication device um, placing them in front of the computer within reach but also um, so if they are communicating with the teacher through the communication device it picks up on the microphone so keep that in mind too big category learners with short attention spans so again that flexible seating and frequent breaks those are going to be the key um, learners with short attention spans are usually um, struggling with a lot of excess energy so giving them a way to divide some of that energy up in a task that's that's less demanding so using their core muscles to, uh, for the yoga ball seating or um, using a fidget that's why those are so, so successful because you don't put much thought into it it's more of that motor skill even having light music in the background um, it gives the brain something else to attach to that's less demanding so that the chunk of their energy um, and brain can focus on the task at hand. Um, doodling is another great activity for that. Having frequent check-ins with them, um, you know, just verbally asking them how they're doing, do you need some support, do you need a break, or using one of those rubrics um, to check in. Um, Assigning tasks. So this is mainly for teachers, but you know, for the uh, learners and, and parents, you can or um, support persons, you can suggest this to your learners' teachers. Um, you know, assigning the the learner that has a shorter attention span different activities like time checks. So uh, this learner will. Uh, put in the chat to the teacher that it's time to get ready for independent work or they can take role um, or look in the chat box for, for questions and alert the teacher. So it's giving them a, a job to keep them more engaged in the course or in the, um, in the class so they're not, you know, being distracted by other things. They have a specific task that they have to complete. Um, so they have to focus more. And then, um, keeping games and social media away until after school because again if you allow them to utilize these tools during breaks and during lunch it makes it even an even more uh an even larger distractor because they're excited about it it's definitely more fun than being in school and it's going to make transition very difficult learners with limited reading abilities um Computers have that screen reader and that narration uh, feature. I went online and on YouTube, I found a video for the MacBooks as well as for the um, PCs on how to turn on your narrator feature. Um, and what this does is it will read everything on the screen. And as a reminder for all of us, because there's a lot of individuals with uh, visual impairments or low reading abilities, and they use the screen readers. So when you are posting pictures, make sure that you describe the pictures because the screen reader will read that too for those with visual impairments. And then also when you're using hashtags and stuff, um, capitalize each word in that hashtag so the screen reader can read that. Otherwise, um, screen readers just read it as individual letters because it makes no sense to them. So that's just a little side note. Um, for those with limited reading skills, you can make picture cards for common words. Um, so they can use the picture cards maybe to answer different questions. Um, and then also check out the websites like Teachers Pay Teachers. Anybody can use that website. Um, Pinterest and then worksheetfun.com. They have a lot of great picture stories and other visual resources that you can utilize um, to help out a learner with limited reading. 
And this is um, some tips for teachers. Number one, make sure you post your office hours so that all uh, learners and their support persons know what time you're available. Open up your daily lessons with a review of the class rules and objectives, just as a reminder. Start the day with an interactive warm up and um, support persons, parent, families. You can do this too in the morning, a scavenger hunt, a joke or a riddle, just a way to get the mind going and kind of, you know, ease into learning for the day. Add music to transitions and independent work times. You can even incorporate specific songs for specific activities um, because that provides an auditory clue, a, a cue, and it helps with transitioning into that task. When you are um, posting information about assignments, make sure that due dates are large and put them in different colors to make them easy to find. Highlight directions and then, um, you know, pop into a private chat or break room for, with students and um, make sure that they understand the steps. Um, include frequent check-in points um, so that you know, if you do the thing like the emoji, everybody can just post their emoji real quick. Nobody has to verbally say I'm having a hard time. That's something that's very challenging for students, especially in middle school and high school. So maybe doing the emoji scale or the plants or some other visual system that allows them to say they need more help or they don't understand, um, you know, as a way to let you know without drawing attention to themselves. Um, and then some wrap ups, because we are already almost at one o'clock, time just flew. Um, number one, the biggest final wrap up point is to just, you know, remember that this is something we've never gone through before. Um, and you're doing a great job. Your learner's doing a great job. You know, it's something that we're figuring out as we go along. So embrace the difference. Um, and, you know, just keep keep going and and take the time to um, look back at how far you've come and um, keep looking for resources and different things to help you overcome different challenges. Um, take the time to help le your learner develop skills in other areas. So, you know, while you're noticing them at home, this might be a great time to help them learn how to find things on websites that are reputable um, and um, how to save different documents and stuff like that. <coughs> Routines and schedules are key, excuse me. Take the time to celebrate those small accomplishments as well as the big ones. Communicate often in different formats. So email is great, but also it's great to shoot a video and send that out. Make sure you're taking care of yourself and you're incorporating self-care throughout your day. Stay creative. Make sure you're building a support system and Check in with, a, there's a lot of uh, resources out there. PTZ is a great resource. You are welcome to always reach out to me and my crew. Um, and there are many, many others that can help you with this journey. This is all my contact information. Again, feel free to reach out. And I thank you all so much for joining me today. I hope this has been helpful. And um, Tina will be emailing you the slides as well as that virtual learning template. Again, thank you all so much. Sapora, we have one question, okay. um, additional question. Um, a mom said that her son doesn't like to read on his own, that he would prefer to listen to a narrator. Uh -huh. Any suggestions on um, getting him interested in reading on his own? So my biggest suggestion for that, number one, there's an app that you can put on tablets, I think computers and phones called Libby. It taps into your library, so it's a free app. And what you can do is find the book, the audio book, and then get him the book in print as well. And start him with reading along with the audio book, and then you can start phasing, phasing the uh, audio book out. Finding books um, that are of interest to him, graphic novels count, comic books count, so, you know, just finding a lot of that material that, that he's interested in, um, and then as much as you can, pairing it with that free, it's, it's Libby or Overdrive. They're the same um, concept. It's kind of like Audible, but it's, it's the different books at your local library, um, and you can get the, check out the print book from the library and then connect him with the audio version 
and let him read along with that. And he's seeing the words as long as he, as well as hearing it. It's a book, um, you know, related to his interests. And that usually is enough to, to get them more interested in reading independently. Awesome. Thank you so much. And again, thank you so much for joining us for our last webinar series. Please take just a few moments and complete the survey and stay in touch with Pizza. We have some additional great things coming. Dr. Sapor, thank you so much again for your time. And we always appreciate the collaboration. Thank you. Bye-bye.